Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar, Twitter is Changing, brought to you by The Space. Um, I'm Linda Coburn, I'm the uh, producer, moderator for the webinar, so I'm just going to start by giving you a little bit of setup of what's going to go on before we get into the content. Um, if any of you don't know about The Space, we've got a slide that gives you a little bit of an overview. In essence, we're the, um, the digital uh, commission commissioning agency for, for arts in the space um, and we've, sorry, for in the in the sector and we've um, worked with more than 800 organisations really supporting and advising their digital activity around arts and cultural content and the webinars that we bring to you are part of the sector support work and really sort of drawing on our experience from working with such a broad range of organisations. Um, the, uh, the plan for today, I'll just show you that and then just talk to you a little bit about how we'll work. Um, Fiona Morris, our uh, creative director, is going to sort of set it up really by thinking, why is this important to us as an organisation? Why should the, the arts and culture sector be thinking about this? Um, and then we'll be uh, meeting our two panellists, our, our host and, our, and Dr. Rihanna Walcott and, and her guest, Paula Akpan, who were really, you know, it's, a, it's an in conversation between the pair of them and with you as an audience. So just to give you an overview of uh, Rihanna and Paula, Rihanna is based at the University of Maryland's Black Communication and Technology Lab. She's a postdoctoral fellow of the DISCO, marvellously named DISCO Network. And she really investigates the impact of social and racial inequalities on digital spaces. And Paula is a journalist, a historian and a speaker, and her work focuses on blackness, queerness, social politics, and our relationship with technology. And they're bringing all of that and their interest to bear on this conversation. So there's a, the, the discussion is between the pair of them to, to start with. And um, as an audience, we really encourage you to use the chat function for your kind of thoughts and responses and questions. And then after the break, we'll have a lot of time then for, for the questions from the audience and a bit more of an exchange between all of you. Um, and then leading to uh, final thoughts at the end and a moment to have an evaluation of the, of the webinar itself. Um, so, so that's the first thing to say is really, we really encourage the use of chat because it's a big audience. Um, it's, that's our, the best way and easiest way of communicating. So we have um, Jen, our captioner with us today. And um, if you want captions, um, that you can link to them from the bottom of your Zoom page. And there will just, there's a, we put a, a note into the chat explaining to you how the captions work. Um, also the webinar is recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel for about six months or so after the event. Um, and that's it really. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you get a lot out of it. And I'm going to hand over now to Fiona, who will just kick us off with her thoughts on this as a, as a subject and why we care about it. Thank you, Linda. And uh, thanks to everybody for taking time to join us today. And um, I'm going to keep this really short just to say, obviously, um, the whole subject of Twitter and the changes going on there um, have been all over the media since since the uh, since the late autumn before Christmas with Elon Musk's takeover. So that meant it was a subject that we were monitoring as an organisation, like any of you may be working for, kind of considering what our options were, whether we should be taking ourselves off the platform. And if we did, what did that mean for us? Um, particularly as an organisation working within within the digital sphere. And I suppose it just made me reflect and the rest of the space team reflect on what does it speak to in the wider context? And I guess the space's own development and history is, is a good example of, you know, just quite how fast moving and volatile this whole revolution in information technology has been over the last two decades and as an organization set up 10 years ago we've had to pretty much constantly um, evolve and adapt our program of support for the cultural sector to respond to the changes that that we're seeing and and although this is kind of going back into what 
what feels like the dim distant mists of time but it was just 10 years ago when the space was set up and I can remember at that time you know that YouTube didn't even let you have your own channel at that time it was it was its own owned channel and nothing else you know Facebook didn't support video Instagram TikTok and WhatsApp were all just kind of fledgling ideas being worked on by their creators so we know the space is moving incredibly fast and evolving and we all acknowledge that within social media specifically it's had an enormous impact in ways that we could never maybe have anticipated it would have and yet we're still really unclear about how we would want to effectively, if we could ever effectively regulate these global spaces how could we make them accountable um, and that feels really strange. We're the users, we're the publishers, we're the consumers. So you would think that there's a perfect circle here where we should have influence to be seen and heard. And yet that's not happening. And there's conversation about regulation, but we can all see the difficulties there. We can't go back. This Pandora's box is open. It can't be closed. But it felt to us as an organization, it's important that within our shared community of interest within the cultural sector, and many others globally, we need to start framing the questions that we want to ask about transparency, about the means and mechanisms for achieving change and accountability, and really how do we best make use of our power um, as communities of shared interest to actually have impact. So today we have invited along two people with whom we worked at base over the years and who are way more knowledgeable about all of this than me. So I'm just going to stop. This is about discussion. Um, so please do feel free to use the chat. And uh, I'm just going to hand over to Dr. Rihanna Walcott and Paula Akpan. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, really thrilled to be here again. And it's lovely to see such an impressive turnout um, and I'm enjoying seeing everyone's um, introductions to each other in the chat. Please do keep that coming. So I'm absolutely delighted um, to introduce, you know, my best friend, Paula Akpan. <laughs> um, we're gonna have, um, you know, a sort of a bit of chat here where we talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we've been observing, the way that we use social media, you know, the kind of kitchen table talk about the kind of, um, our access and experience of these platforms and what it means to have these kinds of um, these moments where um, an actual like a like a, a really visible change is happening in like such a short time that means that the way that we interact with the platform changes very abruptly so um, yes I will kick us off just by asking um, introducing the context really briefly um, you may have seen that I posted a um, that we posted a blog post um, a few days before the webinar that sort of introduced some of these concerns and and uh, tied it together with um, a previous webinar that we ran in I want to say October that thought about again something that Paula has been writing about about the way that algorithms impact our engagement with digital spaces so. Social media platforms are a key part of our every lives and everyday lives, and they play a significant role in everything from our media consumption to our purchasing habits to our political beliefs. However, the platforms we've come to rely on are not just passive containers for this content. They play a large and often invisible part in mediating the content they host. So in the case of Twitter's recent and controversial management change, there's been a spotlight on the company's internal workings that leads us to ask, Twitter is changing, what does that mean for arts and culture? But I would of course like for us to also think about how this works outside of just Twitter. Of course, we use more platforms than just Twitter to, um, you know, within arts and cultural spaces, you know, this might impact the way that we think about spaces like Instagram and Facebook advertising as well. So, Paula, um, <laughs> I'd love to just open up by asking you, how do you, like, what kinds of platforms do you use and how do you use them? How they, um, you know, how do they impact your career? Mm, that's a really good question. And also, hi, everyone. Nice to see so many excited um, messages in the chat and um, getting to know each other. So that's nice. Hi. Um, so what do I use? I would say that my primary uh, platforms are 
Instagram, Twitter. Um, I would say that's honestly it. I refuse to join TikTok because <laughs> that is just, <laughs> it's just too much information. And also my fiance, she has TikTok. So I'm seeing everything regardless. Um, I would say that Instagram is probably my primary space um, because I think that I really enjoy the like photo album kind of feel. And I think also there's like a level of awareness on Instagram to some degree that we are all posting and sharing our best bits. Like this mm. is our curated feed and um, yeah, that it's almost like a personal archive. And obviously as a historian, I try and force everything to be an archive, but everything mm. is not. Anyway, um, that's right. Um, <laughs> And it's so interesting um, because I think especially a few years ago, especially before the pandemic, I would say that I was trying to utilise both Instagram and Twitter quite similarly so that I would make make blah, maybe make a post about an article that I've just written on Instagram and then reuse that copy on Twitter and mm. or if I'd like posted like a carousel or something then it's just like okay I'm just gonna share that over on Twitter in a tweet and um interestingly and this is something that I've only started to think about um in conjunction with this upcoming well this talk now um but that I felt maybe a bit too exposed on Twitter and this mm. is even before um everything with Elon Musk really started um getting us to where we are now um but just the so many things can be removed from their context on twitter quite easily and that opens you up to so much and i think that i think personally i found it very difficult um when my partner and i got engaged and i had shared our um just an engagement picture on Instagram and then on Twitter I just shared it because obviously I'm gassed I'm excited and just sharing like news that is important to me um, <laughs> but then it just it very quickly <laughs> went beyond my control and it had 30 something likes and thousands of retweets and it was reaching enclaves where people were responding to um the picture just like this isn't right this is two women trying to marry each other mm. and all of that kind of stuff so something that was really joyous and personal was very quickly taken out of my control and I think I don't remember feeling at the time I'm gonna stop using Twitter or take a step back from Twitter but I think it has definitely shaped which ways I'm using which platforms so basically just like a very long introduction to uh the platforms I'm using there's such so much great stuff in there I was just <laughs> on the side right I'm gonna go through that you know like forget my questions because this is great <laughs> I'm gonna start with what you said about Instagram being like a curated personal archive and then everything as an archive because obviously we talked about that so much like thinking about um you know archiving as something that is a living process something that's constantly changing I'm thinking about the impact that has on arts and culture as well I mean one of the things that I was thinking about even just the fact that this is going to be archived in some way but only for six months mm. right so mm. this talk has like a very specific lifespan it's like you know this is being curated in a way it's going onto a specific platform but only for a short time and, you know, social media gives us this opportunity, this sort of false idea that um, that everything will be around forever, mm -hmm. when actually it doesn't have to be at all. And even just the way that you've deliberately changed the way that you use it, you know, and even so what you were saying about cross posting, you know, mm -hmm. you've got this one piece of content that you're putting in one place and then you're referring to it in another place. And that takes it out of like, you know, that's the, the thing that you didn't like is when you lost control over mm. the it was seen by so there's like a few things in there there's like a you know the fact that we're talking about the the way that social media is like really exposed and you have this limited amount of control as an individual as a company as an organization over who's going to pick it up you know which you want to talk a little bit about how we manage that control you know like how do how do you 
ensure that your content reaches the audience that you want it to reach? Um, very good question. Digital humanist, Rihanna Walker. <laughs> um, I would say that there are a few different ways that you can kind of try and direct your content to a specific audience. I think one is obviously like the language that you use. So like, I know that if I'm speaking to other Black people in the UK who are on Twitter, who we obviously call Black Twitter, um, then there is a certain vernacular that I am using, not forced because I am Black and in mm. Britain. So there is a way that we can kind of talk to each other um, that almost, for the most part, can um, slip under the radar or mm under oh, sorry, under surveillance I think um, which is quite interesting and important when you think about the fact that a lot of maybe journalists or um, you know I'm so certain that I have a lot of like Daily Mail journalists or a lot of right-wing journalists who follow me and other black people who um, might be outspoken or share their insights or thoughts or opinions on Twitter quite regularly. And then you'll see your thoughts showing up in some sort of think piece, or it will be again removed from um, that context. So I guess that sometimes changing and shifting the way that we're talking is a way of trying to just direct it to that focal audience. Mm. Um, yeah. Absolutely. So like there's the discourse aspect, but I was also, you know, also thinking about even just the very like that's um, like a self-managed, self-guided mm -hmm. way, which I think is really important for us to um, think about in light of Twitter changing in this way, thinking about how we're going to continue to reach our audiences. And a part of that is going to be specifically the types of language we use. But there's also, you know, thinking about filter bubbles, mm. and thinking about, you know, who we follow, yes. who follows us. Um, there's obviously <laughs> this is more important on like a personal level of use but you know thinking about having alternative accounts like specifically focused accounts that have very specific reach very specific um, yeah. and you know even just like the some of the affordances of the platforms that mean that you're able to post close friends and you know Mm -mm. I'm talking I would, about finsters and yeah sorry <laughs> no I was no these are really good points and I would say that for example close friends has been such a lifesaver especially mm. if you are someone who is maybe slightly more visible in particular spaces like me like I'm a journalist like I, I would say that I'm quite visible in some spaces um and you just want to communicate with friends you don't want everything to be a um some sort of commentary on work that you're doing but actually you're just like I want to just post this picture of me in this you know arsenal kit this because I'm a footballer <laughs> now <laughs> you know I just I want to share this kind of news with or like this information with people that I um that know me because I mm. think that that is also something that we have found with these social media, media platforms is like an over familiarity um because we feel closer to people um as a result of you know you're watching someone's story constantly you see all their big life updates and announcements so you feel like you know them to some degree and I think that social media has kind of like collapsed this distance a bit but also it it isn't necessarily replicable in real life um, because again, you're citing and referencing social media. So someone you might someone might come up to you somewhere and say, oh my God, I saw that you were X, Y, Z, you went on holiday and blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's referencing social media content rather than um, mm. them having that knowledge through, um, you know, having spoken about it. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how it ended up here. I can really just talk. So yeah, please direct For the me. best. No, 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 that's great. Like, I mean, so thinking about the way, like I think the question that I think comes up from that is I'm thinking about what kinds of requirements, like you mentioned this sort of artificial closeness and like reasons why you might direct your audience in a specific way for different purposes. And, you know, also just thinking about the impact that social media has on your literal work like in fact would you mind um mentioning that a little bit like obviously as a journalist back in the day you were using twitter quite a lot for 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so as a journalist, um, I would say that I get a lot of case studies um, from Twitter. And it's been, it has been so, so life changing um, to have this kind of, so in one respect, the fact that something can spiral beyond your control is quite mm. daunting on a personal level, but in terms of work or in terms of trying to reach, um, I'm looking for um, women who are experiencing menopause over the age of 60 and would be willing to speak to me for a piece for, I don't know, Cosmo. And I don't personally have many people who fit these particular requirements in my personal circle, but then this allows me to reach Mm. a lot more people. People will be messaging me in the DMs just like, oh, I am like X, Y, Z, or I know someone who'd be interested in, like people who are not even following you or that you're not necessarily tangentially linked with Mm -hmm. have found your tweet and are now offering up this information. Um, And then it also goes beyond, you know, trying to source case studies. It's um, just in getting work. So I, there have been so many times that I have Mm -hmm. read a thread about something, um, which I don't do anymore, which we can get to as well. Mm. Um, but a thread about something I felt really strongly about. And then an editor has emailed me or DM'd me saying, this sounds really interesting. Would you be interested in writing an 800 word to a thousand word piece on this? Um, I I was like, I think two years ago during Love Island, I was just tweeting, like t- tweeting wreck. And then <laughs> ended up getting a column for The Face to <clears throat> write about Love Island every week. Um, so it was things like that that is so like important for freelancers like I've been freelance since November 2018 and I was actually talking about it yesterday I was like sometimes it's actually quite scary when you when you step back from it and you realize it's actually like things in my head right now that are paying the bills um (laughs) like if you really like get into it it's yeah yeah same Um, same like if I stop thinking I stop eating (laughs) right what if something happens what if you're in an accident or something and like anyway anyway touch wood touch wood um but I've been freelance since November 2018 and Twitter has been a uh, a lifeblood in that in that time because um it's I think it's so many people do this as well now like when you're leaving a position then it's like personal news personal announcement I am now no longer with xyz I am available for commissions and xyz you can contact me here so like there's also this element of Twitter but also other um platforms being like an extension of your personal portfolio an extension Mm -hmm. of your um it's almost like a jobs board at the same time and it's the website almost exactly exactly I didn't need any kind of website and I still barely have a website um, because, and also again, this is me putting too much stock in the likes of Instagram because Instagram could go down tomorrow, but Mm. feeling like I, if you go through my grids, I always share my articles and things that I'm mm. doing. There. So anyone who's maybe interested in reaching out to me for work, you can take a look at my social media profiles and it will hopefully point you in some direction of these are the topics that I work on. This is what interests me. Um, and it's another way of kind of mm. advertising yourself. Um, your archive, the archive of your work. Again, can I just ask? Work. Has that moved from Twitter to Instagram? Because, I mean, I'm thinking about how different those functions are. Twitter is like a visual archive. Um, sorry, Instagram is a visual archive. Twitter is more of a discursive platform. Has that been pretty seamless for you? Like, because, I mean, I'm thinking also about the career stage you're at versus, you know, um, or like, you know, thinking about an organization that might mm. have like an output as an individual, you know, as opposed to an individual. Also thinking about like, if um you know you mentioned like I'm thinking about hashtag journal request mm. right what has filled that gap like obviously you're at a different stage of your career mm. to perhaps someone starting out like how what what do we do if I mean obviously Twitter's getting unwieldy is getting nasty like what <laughs> is there like a seamless way that that switch to Instagram could even happen honestly I don't think so 
And I think mm. this is probably why Twitter's um, downfall. Feels so necessary. Un- yeah, mm. unraveling feels so... Um, I feel like it feels so personal for a lot of people as well Mm. because I think I remember I can't remember what day it was but I remember when people were saying Twitter is going down this weekend oh my god I'm so stressed (laughs) yeah because you need to you need to download (laughs) I was in the movies I came out and and, like my phone was blowing up and Jade was like where are you (laughs) I went home I was on the bus I stopped talking to my sister I started like sending, you know, like downloading all sorts of things. I was paying for, I was paying for all of these like tweet scraper, blah, 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 like all these programs. Cause you know, there was this moment where I was like, oh my God, I, you know, people were saying it as though it was going to happen imminently, like mm. overnight. And then it didn't happen. I felt like a real fool, but I had my archive. <laughs> a fool with an archive downloaded. <laughs> but this is it. And I, I think it was, interesting seeing how much twitter meant to so many mm. people on a, a grieving it was a public almost like display of grief yeah mourning yeah. and mm. like i've made so many friends Very while it's funerary mm. exactly and um i think i think that display of emotion at a social media platform um, Mm. really speaks to how integrated how seamless Twitter has become like within our lives and I don't think that there is a replacement for it but also Mm. maybe okay so one I don't think that there is a replacement for the kind of the way that you search Twitter, the way that you can kind of search your own tweets, search mm. other people's tweets, and you know, this you people with their own historic mistakes. Um, so I think there's that, but I also wonder if there isn't like if we're burnt out from all of these platforms, mm. is it, you know, everyone's been talking about moving over to a new uh, platform, Macedon, and all of that, but even the thought of doing that is very, um, and something I'm not going to do, um, yeah. <laughs> but very simply, um, yeah. I, I think primarily because it requires a lot of upheaval. I think that part of why Twitter has been so successful is because so many of us have actually been on it since, you know, since it started, since it started, I've been on it since 2011. So mm. even though there is this element of, Twitter being very fleeting because you put a tweet out and then that's, you know, you just shared your thought, it's out into the ether. Um, but actually we have very long standing relationships with this, with these kinds of platforms. And like, it's a lot of, you have to build that all up again. You have to build all of the connections that you've made up again as an organization. Mm. If you are sourcing, you know, like creative, um, your creative recruitment pool via Twitter, you have to build those connections again. So I think that maybe that's also part of the reluctance um, and frustration because um, why it's, it's, it's a lot of strain. And then also thinking about what we've been through outside mm. of social media. Um, I guess the question is like, really, is it worth it? Especially so when people have that energy. Yeah. yeah. But speaking of that, I mean, you mentioned like, you know, the building of a, the whole new network again. I think that this is a really good time to point out um, how Twitter started to try and block that. So you mentioned Mastodon and there is like a, you know, like I think anyone who's on Twitter right now will have seen some of the discussions that people are saying, oh, where are we going next? Lots of people changing their Twitter handles to include their Mastodon profiles, et cetera, et cetera. First of all, Mastodon doesn't, isn't a, a neat swap for Twitter just because of the way it functions. Um, it's individual servers. There's lots of things you have to consider. And also in terms of accessibility and in terms of um, it being also like, you know, thinking about safety, like Twitter is not a safe space, God knows. However, Masterson is no better. Masterson has like a the same sort of, like people um, who have moved over there recently have been you know, quite well documenting the sort of increase in hate speech they've been they've been um, facing over there. So um, I've been thinking about that, and also um, maybe I'll share screen and show this. Yeah. Uh, wait, give me a second, just because I want to show this. Literally, this one 
thing, this one screenshot <laughs> I took from Twitter that I thought had a very, you know, showed about this violation of the policy, the Twitter violation policy from my article. Wait, give me one second. Okay, because I noted that Twitter was sort of blocking this, um, the cross platform posting. So if you take a look at this here, you can see what's a violation of this policy at both the tweet level and account level, we will remove any free promotion of prohibited third party social media platforms, such as linking out to any of the below platforms on Twitter or providing your handle without a URL. And that includes Facebook, Instagram, Mastodon, Truth Social, Tribal Post and Noster. I've not even heard of some of those, but also, you know, even the link, link aggregators like Linktree, Link in Bio. So this is actually a violation of European legislation against gatekeeping as a platform. So it was a really chaotic move for um, Twitter to do in the first place. But also like, I think that that really shows us something quite interesting and quite frightening about the direction that we're going here. You know what I mean? Like, um, you know, there's this idea that we can in some way sort of gatekeep these platforms, gatekeep the archive, gatekeep these sorts of works, which is, you know, not the point of social media. The whole point, a lot of this stuff is, um, is about cross-posting. You know, you post your articles on Instagram, on your grid, so that they're visible in that visible way. That is your visual archive. And then you go to Twitter and you say, oh, I have a journal request. Does anyone want to speak to me about this? The way that platforms work together in terms of social media marketing is very, very important. You can't access half your audience if you're only using one, you know? So, you know, I'm thinking about... Um, that as a condition, I'm not 100% I'm, I'm not sure how that went down with Twitter. I don't think the gatekeeping thing actually worked out. <laughs> but the point is, um, you know, the, even the, the impact of, of trying, I think, is a very interesting thing, especially when we consider how few platforms, we, how few popular platforms we actually have and the kinds of monopolies that we have. Mm, I think it's also quite interesting because... Um, it almost shows must he's he's basically showing his ass there right yeah and <laughs> losing it but, absolutely losing it <laughs> but twitter has always been so integrated with it's like, about talking about what's happening in the news and the media that's what it's for <laughs> so it's almost it's a very strange like juxtaposition there because yeah. Twitter is like Twitter is how I've sometimes gotten the news faster than yes. BBC anywhere else, you know, or received more coverage over a particular topic than any kind of mainstream media. Um, so it's it's a quite interesting and um, just a strange move because it's almost does Elon Musk understand the place that Twitter has actually occupied um, mm -hmm. within the public sphere, essentially. Um, and it seems that his emphasis is very much free speech and, um, you know, shaking and challenging what has existed before. But at what cost? You know? Yeah, at the cost of what the platform is actually for. And like, I think it shows a real disconnect with how people use the platform which is a worry and you know we that is the kind of so when I'm thinking about the requirements we have of our social media platforms that to me seems like one of the biggest requirements we have for Twitter you know the immediacy the ability to speak to other platforms and other you know to, to get our news you know it's supposed to be a holding space a hub for discourse so if you mm -hmm. block that discourse those discourse channels I mean this also reminds me of you know earlier in the chat and you also mentioned an aversion to TikTok that everyone's got right here ah, very cute which uh, you know I will say I <laughs> I have TikTok purely you know to lurk because I'm too old <laughs> but I have it oh, yeah I'm a grown woman I have it because I have to stay current <laughs> as a researcher as well so I need to know what's up but there's also been you know very recent developments in some of the universities in America that have banned the use of TikTok for research, study and use. Mm. So, you know, I think that, you know, TikTok is currently, um, I think it's banned in the University of Texas. You can't use it on any university equipment. 
So I couldn't have it on any sort of university owned equipment. I wouldn't be allowed to use it in, in teaching. And, you know, I'm a digital humanities scholar. Like this is a, you know, so it's I would have to like- pretty focal. Seek, it's pretty focal. I'd have to like seek a, you know, like a, an exemption and all sorts of things. And I think, you know, when you've got these platform monopolies where, you know, when we think about the big names, we've got Twitter, we've got TikTok, we've got Instagram, Facebook, and it's, <laughs> but obviously Facebook is still very important in yeah. most parts of the world and da da da. You know, and also you still need outside to have your own generation. You still, you still need to have, need to have, to have, have a Instagram. Facebook to have an Instagram as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you know, what happens when one of these drop out of commission? Like, how do the other ones fill the gap? Are they going to fill the gap? Mm. I, well, I mean, I don't know. Obviously, we're not platform developers. <laughs> we're not platform developers. Um, just watch. But we're also watching these various platforms try and merge and emulate, what, like, merge into and emulate one another like one of the mm. biggest gripes that I've been seeing with Instagram is like if you don't have video um like video content reels as, yeah yeah reels as your like primary means of producing content then you're going to get pushed further down or less visible to followers um and there being an increasing emphasis by Masseri that's his, is that how you pronounce his name Adam Masseri uh, Instagram I don't know um <laughs> like a lot of people constantly commenting on his post just like when will we be able to just post photos so I guess there's also this element that maybe that's what we're seeing right now that nothing is for free and if it's for free you are the product and I think mm -hmm. maybe we're starting to realize that we are the product like if you are not posting reels or you're not like then there's no no point to posting photos obviously we still do yeah but your visibility is severely limited and if you are someone who wants to be a content creator etc then that becomes something that's very focal for you um mm. but I think also what's quite interesting if we're talking about being on Twitter or on these profiles and we also need to be able to talk about what it means to be off them um mm. I think that what has been crucial to managing my relationship with social media has been being able to regularly come off it and like self-impose just like I need a break but as I learned quite recently when I tried to log out of Twitter because they have lost their engineers and those teams who manage the um the two-step auth authentication um mm. process which I had it where um if I logged out of Twitter, I would receive an SMS text and then it would have a code that would allow me to get back into Twitter. But because the teams have been fired or they are, you know, it's very thin on the ground with the employees who manage that, I was not getting the text message or I was getting like an error kind of response. Oh, they're a mess. A mess. Right? So <laughs> then it meant that I had to tinker with Twitter on my laptop, which I thankfully hadn't logged out of, and then change it so that... Um, my gmail helps me log into twitter or whatever mm -hmm. so this idea that now how you actually take space from these platforms is also kind of compromised um when you know their internal mess becomes very apparent um yeah that's really interesting thank you because i you know i think the real time actual de you know de degrading of the platform is something that you know, people are talking, people talk a lot about the Twitter takeover as something that is, and I do notice that there's some questions in here. And if we don't get to those questions in this short part of the conversation, don't worry, we will absolutely be back after the Q&A to talk, talk through all the questions we see here. But the, you know, like even just people, the, the focus of the conversation is often on the, uh, like the ethical concerns of using Twitter, what's happening, the actual like real time update. And not so much about the actual like, well, this platter is, this platform is slowly breaking to pieces. Mm. You know, it doesn't have the manpower to continue unless something changes. So that's a thank you for that example there. Um, so you've talked a little bit about the alternatives that like involve coming off the platform and like mm. that. Did, you know, I, I mean, I'm thinking about you know the audience that we have here that is largely you know like a lot of it is thinking about like comms teams thinking about engaging with the platform in such a way that you know you know as communication communications experts 
Um, and I'm wondering about like, you know, our personal movement away, the kinds of declines in decline in engagement. I've personally noticed my sort of Twitter following slowly ticking down. Mm. Um, I don't know if you've seen any the big fry you don't see that sort of thing but <laughs> but you know I think also the you know like thinking about like what that decline in engagement means for us in terms of our cultural consumption our you know our artistic consumption like are people actually removing themselves from these spaces and what does that do it how does that impact the way that we're able to actually connect with new audiences and build our um you know as someone who's building a career how do we make sure that our platform is accessible and visible mm. so that's a really meaty question no it is and I'm gonna get on to you about that offline okay okay cool sorry sorry I'm gonna fight you <laughs> later don't worry about it um so I think just what I thought of immediately was personally I have tried been trying to engage with arts and culture more in person so like even if my engagement might be declining online it's because after years of lockdown and mm. after a lot of precarity around um public health which we still rightfully and necessarily have not enough people wearing masks still um but the now that there is like more of an like we, we feel more able and more capable to engage with things in real life than we did mm. before. So I wonder if maybe for me personally, I might not necessarily be um, showing up on a live stream of something, but that's because I'm trying to go to it in real life. I'm trying Ooh. to engage with it in real life. Um, yeah. I'm trying to be in the room. So I think maybe there is um, space to contend with that, that maybe it's not a failure or a setback of um no like my dwindling engagement etc maybe people are actually trying to engage with you in other means um and like I'm going to the feminist library like three times over the next like few weeks just because they have loads of events on and I'm so excited to be there I'm so excited to like touch things rather than have yeah. to like have a conversation online which obviously for accessibility reasons is crucial but yeah. as someone who doesn't necessarily need to um watch video or have those accessibility accessibility measures like I am able to engage with it um in real time um thank you that's a really interesting you know because like I think that reminder that the people engaging with these things aren't going anywhere and that perhaps this is like a, you know, a natural dip that is related to something else, not just, you know, mask mess and everything up. It's also an actual fatigue with social media platforms in general. So that's, that's, um, that's really good to, to bear in mind. Thank you. Um, what, would, what was the other part of your question around that? I can't remember. Okay, great. Well, that's <laughs> <laughs> You know, I just talk. I'm just I know, I know. <laughs> That's how you got the doctorate, babe. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes. <laughs> With the, um, I also wondered, like, are there any of the sort of changes to Twitter that you've noted over the last, you know, six months that you think are worthy of like discussion here? And if anyone here has in in the chat, I'm looking at, I'm looking through some of these comments here as well um, about the immediacy of Twitter, the Instagram algorithm taking days to kick in and you know being rubbish for events and so on and someone's mentioned also you know the the, the video looping rip no i just remembered an even better question sorry you know you were mentioned the reels on instagram and how like there's definitely um a sort of push towards engaging in that way and the way that platforms are starting to converge you know mm. everyone has a story everyone has a space everyone has a reel or video component um, and like we're all aware that there's certain things that drive engagement more than others. I'm really interested in, you know, like thinking back to that article that you wrote for Bustle, you know, about the algorithms and about, um, you know, how unfair it is and the, the ways that people have to change the way they engage in order to, to increase their engagement, right? Mm. And like how a lot of these things are sort of spread by word of mouth. You learn that. Um, you know it's better to get a bookmark than a like and a share is better than this and that you know like I think these sorts of like 
shared bits of wisdom that go from person to person and talk about driving engagement. Um, I just wanted, I wondered if you had any comments on that, like on, you know, in terms of like how that works cross platforms um, and like what, what that move towards sort of video content is happening, you know, like this TikTok business versus reels. Like, do you have any thoughts about that? Like in terms of like the way that we should be engaging? Mm -mm. I feel, I guess, again, it depends on what you're utilizing these platforms for like that's what it always comes down to because mm. if you are hell-bent on becoming an influencer you are trying to amass all of this knowledge so that you can do that yeah like the the tips always you know preferably pre post on a Saturday around like mm. 12 for uh, you know all the people who are chilling and reclining on a Saturday and just scrolling through um and if that is if you are trying to tap into those audiences, then of course this is actually very necessary and very useful. And it always is the creatives who are sharing this, you know, back end knowledge, how to kind of hack these things because you have to. And, um, you know, it's, I, I think that it's useful in that sense, but I think it's also useful for people who don't want to actually be an influencer or a content creator because then maybe there are tips for what you can avoid doing because yeah. you don't particularly want to be seen you don't for sure. you don't want to be consumed in this way so there's also like room for like okay let me actually post not do that <laughs> exactly on weekdays at 5 p.m <laughs> because I I guess like there is um I, th it, I think it's really at this point, you're making a decision as to like, do you want to be producing content? Like, do you want to be content or like, are you trying to push against that for yourself? And like, mm. I think that's something that I'm personally trying to push against for myself. So like, I utilize close friends like nobody's business. Mm. Like for the most part, I think 80% of things that I share on Instagram, it's mostly going on close friends because these are the people that I'm trying to be in conversation with um wait how did I get here <sighs> no because I mean the thing it's interesting that you're talking about the sort of the community versus the you know like because this is going to be entirely different advice for whether you're an individual using this as like an individual um who's promoting work or whatever or you know just trying to live your life online versus if you're an organization that has to have a certain level of visibility but I, what I am interested in is you know you talked about this sort of word of mouth sharing between people mm. you know the tips and tricks the way that we learn about what the back end of social media platforms look like without their actual like you use the word hacking mm. which as you know I'm a big fan of in terms of talking about platforms <laughs> you're, one of the few, you're one of the few people on the planet who's read my whole thesis so <laughs> So um, I'm just thinking about, um, you know, th that idea of hacking the, like, and, you know, I want to try, draw it back to, you know, one of those things that we both care so much about marginalized communities using these platforms and the sort of ethics and the care that goes into using these platforms safely. Mm. So, you know, you've got people who are learning these things about how the back end of the platform works in order to either increase or decrease their visibility as a politic of safety you know, mm -hmm. as part of their ethic of care, you know, I wouldn't necessarily post, you know, there's certain content that has to be for limited eyes and certain content that can be for more eyes, you know, mm -hmm. I wonder like what the, um, yeah, like, I just wondered if you had any comments about that, about the way that we as users, as, you know, users who are both individuals who are freelancers trying to make money etc and be visible but also people who are from minority communities who are at risk in the mm. way that you and, and your fiance were at risk with um you know mm. when you posted the, the, the engagement photo mm -mm -mm. and also like on another level at risk as a journalist I would say um, yes because I have been not like docs to the full extent but like but plenty of people are exactly plenty of journalists are I've had like you know my email address put through so many kind of spam thingies I've had like threatening messages over articles that I've written around 
um, black children in education and you know how um, how during lockdown GCSEs and predicted grades was actually going to be quite adverse for um, black children yeah. etc so there are so many levels to it as well um, but I would say that we we are constantly and maybe even if we don't know it we're trying to um, spurn surveillance Yes. And so you see people utilizing um, words that are hashed out or starred out or mm-hmm. with different mm-hmm. characters in order for it to not get picked up by um, the algorithmic kind of processes. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it comes with easily its... found in searches as well, like, you know, by individuals, even just, yeah. Absolutely. You see it in lighthearted ways as well when, you know, Black Twitter is talking about something and it's suddenly like, oh, guys, maybe um, just change your photos and your names in <laughs> as another way to try and, you know, just subvert that um, that surveillance. But then we have seen that it has its own pitfalls as well, because um, I think it was actually with you that I shared that Julia Fox had um, responded to someone on TikTok. The mascara thing. Yes. Yes. You explain it better because this is your food. Oh, no, there's no need. I don't want to interrupt. (laughs) Okay, fine. Um, So Julia Fox had uh, commented on someone's post where they were talking about um, using the term mascara to describe like just like a bad experience that they'd had. And Julia Fox kind of responded very. um, And who, how do we describe Julia Fox? Blithely. She's a... Oh, I don't know. Man. Model was with Kanye West. I don't know. I don't know. Like a bit of a like a sort of uh, eccentric kind of character that people have started to stand. But the uh, the important thing is that she mentioned the, the post said um, it was like, oh, my friend used my mascara and they loved it so much that they shared it with another friend without without my consent. And if you aren't au fait with like, I had no idea what that meant. I assumed they were literally talking about mascara. But, you know, be, being a person who's on TikTok, being of a certain generation, you know how we talked about altering your language so that it, this is an example of all of those things coming together, altering your language so it reaches your desired audience who understand that language and also altering your language to avoid surveillance from the platform or moderation or censorship. Because what they actually were talking about when they talked about mascara was I think it was supposed it was to like be the yeah. genitalia. So, yeah. So they were like, oh, you know, the, the whole post became about sexual violence that was just completely opaque to me. And then yeah. Julia was like, oh, you know, like just blithely responded, like, oh, I don't see how that's so bad, or something like that. Like, oh, this made me laugh. And they were like, it makes you laugh that I talk about sexual assault. And it was like, whoa, <laughs> like yeah. it, you know, that's the sort of thing that um, you know, if you weren't. You know, I, I think that there is, I, I'm, I'm definitely not critiquing the idea of using, uh, you know, like evading surveillance in this way, because I think it's important that we do. But also at the same time, a lot of people will not, <laughs> casual yeah. interlopers will not understand what you're talking about. Yeah, it and becomes it, quite granular. Um, yes. And the coded language is even kind of escaping people who might actually be part of the you, audience you could yes. enter that as well because if anyone should know it should be you and me like it's you know it was a very odd situation that moment and I think you know that that's where hacking you know when we're thinking about the ways that we need to engage with these platforms going forward because this is important we need to be aware and cognizant of different language um language choices and vernaculars we need to be cognizant of the communities that use them and how we can use them as individuals as organizations in order to get around, yeah, because it is a case at this point where we are thinking about us versus the platforms, the ways mm-hmm. that we can continue to navigate these changes if there are changes that we do not like, if there are changes that do not serve us. You know, we're at this point where we need to think about um, how am I functionally actually going to access this platform and use it in a way that means I still reach my audience when the platform itself is making that difficult. 
Mm. And for some people, the, these things cannot be reconciled. So there are a lot of, for example, Monroe Bergdorf, Sean Fay, and mm. a number of like quite visible trans folks just say, like stating that they are so unsafe in these platforms and that Twitter, long before Elon Musk, was mm. actually not safe. Like there was no um, guarantee or efforts on the part of their moderation policies and moderators to keep them safe. So then they just withdrew, withdrew themselves from the platform. And I think that is also another, I think, something that we're kind of seeing as well, just that people are reckoning with how crucial is it for me mm. to be part of this online ecosystem against like my own personal safety? Um, yes. And I think that that is something that has been increasingly coming into contention, especially as, you know, so many of like, there are so many queer people in these spaces. There are so many marginalized groups in these spaces. And it's one way that we are also making connections. Like I wrote an article yes. um, about young black people during the pandemic and how, you know, many of them were living in um, really hostile environments. Um, and when I say pandemic, I mean during lockdown. So mm. being dead named at home or misgendered at home, not able to make connections with people who affirmed them, their friends who also were, you know, like just of similar identities or backgrounds where there was this element of familiarity and understanding. And it was during this time that social media and like this now um, pivot to an increase in accessible spaces online meant that people were able to continue trying to foster those relationships in some way as some sort of lifeline when their home environments were very um were painful for them to be in so there are there are so many things that you have to um, thank you for that yes yeah that you have to like like consider it's not a cut and dry it's not a question that's the thing and I think this is what's frustrating sometimes when we talk about social media and I think a lot of well not a lot of let me not say that but sometimes when I'm hearing especially people who clearly are not utilizing social media personally or do not have a personal relationship with it um but are saying that you know social media is so bad and xyz Mm. I'm always thinking just like social media has created and solidified so many relationships so many connections so many um movements yes we were seeing where would we be without it like at this point in terms of advancement of so many different you know I think that question about like because um we did receive a question um we're gonna have to take a short break and I would love to like jump right back into this because it's, it's such a rich point the idea about the ethics of continuing to use these platforms but thank you so much for drawing you know attention to the fact that it's a bit more nuanced than like Mm. oh it's bad now you know so you know there's users on platforms there are these different enclaves there are different communities that use it in different ways I don't always see you know I you know the way that you curate your space curate your archive means you won't always necessarily even see the stuff you don't want to see you know there's a reason why we use group chats there's a reason why we use public you know private facing um, parts of the platform so um, I think there's a more, possibly a slightly different ethical question in terms of whether you're an organization or an individual. But I think that removing the lifeline for a lot of people to these spaces is also an unethical choice in some way. So I think, yeah, we'll definitely return to that because there's a, a lot more to say. But um, in the meantime, everyone, um, we're going to take a five minute break. So please do come back, um, you know, a few minutes past the hour. And yeah, we'll be back. And in that time, I would love if you could keep having these conversations in the chat. I would also love if you could um, put any questions that you have for us that you'd love to see us um, tackle in the second part of this. Okay, so we will be back in a few minutes. And thank you so much for sticking around.
You're still on mute, babe. Yeah. You were using your headphones, if that helps. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so hello. Hey, everyone, welcome back. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we should leap straight back into that conversation about ethics that we were having. Um, so please do, as you know, as we go, don't forget to keep popping in questions into the chat. Um, we'll have those fed back to me, and um, yeah, we'll we'll keep we'll talk about the ethical the ethical aspect now. So um, I think one of the things that comes to mind when I think about the sort of ethics of continuing to use a space like Twitter under this new usership is that it kind of presupposes that Twitter was an ethical space to use before. <laughs> which it really wasn't, you know what I mean? Um, I also think that, um, you know, like I, I think it's more, to me, the question is more about, does it remain usable? Does it remain functional as opposed to, is it ethical, you know? Because if Twitter gets to a point where advertisers are no longer using it and it's overrun by more bots than there are people, which, you know, it already is, but you know, like you're not reaching anybody, it's not really of any use. Then that's when we start to ask those kinds of questions about um, like, is it still a valuable space? But questioning whether it's like ethical to use becomes a bit more of a sticky question when it when you think about how you're using it, who it's for, who you're reaching. You know, like Paul had just mentioned before the break, thinking about, you know, the value of it as a space for community building and activism. Or um, The, yeah, the value of it as a space for community building of activism, um, the value of it as a space where you can reach, you know, a specific, a very specific community based on how you post. Like, what do you think about that kind of, you know, that kind of question about like, does it remain ethical to use the space? Or like, what is, uh, what would make it ethical as a space? Mm, I think that um, you were spot on with the question of has it ever been an ethical space um and you know it, you'd always have to pass that out into thinking okay if it has been an ethical space and this is now when it's suddenly become unethical who was it ethical for was it ethical an ethical space for all of us or select members felt like they were being protected via the moderation or content policies um but i think the the way that i've always thought about the usability of these spaces is that it should always be sign like a signpost for work that you do offline like the core and crux of your work cannot and should not sit on twitter or instagram it should be able to post like uh, signpost people to what you do offline but you always have to think like if these platforms went down today like, what do you have to show for the work that you've done as an individual or as an organization? And is if these like if a space like Twitter is so focal to the work, then I think it now should be as good a time as any to begin pivoting around that, because, um, you know, we saw the confusion around the badges, like the verified, the blue tick gang, and then suddenly it was a gold tick, then suddenly it was two ticks, like there was a lot happening that kind of points to the threadbare kind of moderation and what is happening on the back end. So I think that that should actually alarm all of us that actually if um, if you are seeing Twitter engineers, like people who were working at Twitter for years, for, for a decade maybe even, and these people are saying that this is, I've left now, things like this are now somewhat defunct, then like, how are you protecting your organization and the work that you do outside of Twitter, outside of Instagram, because this could be Instagram tomorrow. We've already seen what, you know, happened with Facebook and not even just Cambridge Analytica, but other dubious things and elections that Facebook has been involved with, you know, shaping and impacting. So 
it's not just about Twitter. It's not just about Elon Musk. This is, there are symptoms of a much wider problem. And I think the best way for us to address it on like a personal or like an organizational level is how much um, agency do you retain over your work and over your, your um, just like all your practice, your um, like, your audiences, like are people still in contact with you or know how to reach you and engage with you outside of Twitter? Like, is everything so dependent on someone being able to arrive at your Twitter page for them to then engage with your organization? And if that is the case, then I think that that is something that requires some careful attention, um, especially at this moment. Also, if we are thinking about people who are, um you know, the people who are most at risk uh, on social media platforms. I think part of the question has to be about like, well, you know, are we participating in flight away from the platform? You know, like, in fact, people have been, when in terms of thinking about black Twitter, a lot of academics have been talking about this using the terms of white flight. You know, the idea that the platform is getting more unsafe for marginalized communities. And yet marginalized people are the last people to leave. You know, mm-hmm. like there's a, <laughs> you know, there's a real sort of um, hand wringing that sometimes happens. Oh, Twitter's getting like really racist. I'm going to move to Mastodon when actually Black Twitter's going down with the ship. <laughs> Do you know what I no, mean? Truly, we're not going because anywhere. We know we're used to it. We know how to manage it. It's been we... racist. It's, it's exactly. been unethical. And so, the, so hostility is probably going to follow us at every platform that we utilize Mm. and you know it's not just thinking about um racialized communities black communities also thinking about sex workers thinking about queer communities thinking about artists like um in that bustle piece i managed to interview a queer artist whose work was blocked on instagram because um you know it was showing two um like mass people two men like like in an embrace and you know they're naked but like it's literally a drawing it's um thinking about plus size and fat people and how Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know Instagram might flag up their pictures because they are they have more flesh on show purely Mm. because because they have more flesh yeah exactly yeah so like these communities have long known hostility at the hands of um moderators and um developers who Mm -hmm. have never who cannot access or have no interest in accessing um, or engaging these communities and how do we ensure that if you are plus size you're not going to be demonized and then have your um your content you know pushed down or deemed your livelihood sort of affected by it exactly so like really the questions we need to be asking the way we need to be thinking about it is how are these you know how are these people who are most at risk of the unethical turn um how are they managing themselves? How are they using these spaces? How can they be supported? You know, before that question of, you know, it shouldn't be a case of, is it ethical to still use it? Let's leave. It should be, is it ethical to still use it? How can we support the people who are mostly expect- affected? You know, exactly. because you can't, you know, the answer can't be just cutting away. Exactly. Because like, nowhere's ethical. As someone has actually pointed out in the chat, I'm actually going to read it out because it was a really great um, comment. Nicola Barrett wrote, Meta is reinstating Trump's accounts on Facebook and Instagram after a two year ban. TikTok has potentially been using user data in dodgy ways. I'm not sure any social media platform is hugely ethical. Yes, um, the, I think also a lot of these questions about these platforms being ethical or not and what we can do or can't do, sometimes that turns to, um, I think sometimes it's beyond us as organizations, et cetera, to sort of think about the inner workings and the legislation aspects, you know? Because when the company, you know, when I mentioned the gatekeeper platform bit earlier, you know, that was in a direct contravention of like European Union legislation, you know, there are sort of policies and so on that platforms are bound to, platforms that are bound to in different ways, even in America versus Europe and the rest of the world, the ways, you know, like labor laws are different in different places. This is certainly something I've been noticing since getting over here. You know, the conversation about what's happening to the platforms is crazy because, you know, people will be talking about, oh, 
you know, all these people got fired, they have no protection on their job, and then, you know, tried to fire the whole, like, European team in Twitter, and they were like, yeah, good luck. <laughs> you know, labour laws don't work like that here, so you can't just, you know, we're not just going to be turfed out, like, no. <laughs> You're going to pay some hefty severance and some hefty fees kind of thing, which was, you know, I think really interesting to also think about our position globally, you know, like it isn't just um, one size fits all for these sorts of ethical concerns even. Some places have more protections than others. Some places operate differently to others. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah, just, saying, um, yeah. just to bring it back to kind of what you'd said um, around the the kind of hand wringing, I think that mm. that is something that we, we tend to lean into especially like when you feel like you're faced by like a social ill, like how can I make some sort of impactful, um, like impactfully resist this? And um, like we saw it with NSARS in Nigeria um, mm. and, you know, there was this select team of the government that was brutalizing a lot of Nigerians. Um, this is such like a brief and very unnuanced overview, um, but that, a lot of people's response to this was, okay, so the UK, if you were based in the UK, the UK should sanction Nigeria. And it's these overarching like, okay, so we should all just leave Twitter yeah. rather than, okay, but if this country sanctions Nigeria, aren't the people that are still being brutalized by this rogue government force, aren't they still going to be impacted? Like we don't get to the crux of the issue. We just mm. do the thing that makes us feel better and alleviate our personal maybe guilt, um, our feelings of inactivity or just like complicity. And it, I think we rush to that rather than take time. So I think that if you are an organization or community, um, I don't know, collective, whatever, um, and you're considering like the ethics of this, I think like Re said, um, it's thinking about who's going to be most impacted by this unraveling of Twitter, by this push of free speech, mm. by this um, erosion of um, moderation? And how are we going to continue to stay in contact with them and support them? Like, if there are people that you um, have worked with before or you'd like to work with, get their emails. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. make contact with them, like make, contact that doesn't rely on Twitter that doesn't rely on these social media platforms and like how are you trying to I don't know better enrich their lives mm. um in the face of something that's you know disproportionately going to impact them um I think it's doing these smaller gestures that don't get the fanfare of something as dramatic as our organization is now deciding that we're not going to be using Twitter going forwards because Musk is blah 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 like actually sometimes it is the smaller and more granular work that is the most impactful for um yeah journalists or freelancers or creatives who like let me tell you like freelancing is so stressful <laughs> and mm. I'm sure like people can imagine but when Twitter or a social media space has been part and parcel of your practice you know I have an article to write so I'm just going to reach out to all these case studies when this is now looking like an option that might be closing down to you that is very scary so the idea that an, an organization might still want to work with you even if you don't have the same visibility or you don't still have this you know this twitter profile you're not able to mm. following that company or that organization i think that 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 means something maybe mm. um yeah. absolutely thank you so um we've got about you know, just over 10 minutes left of the webinar. Um, I'm some of these questions that uh we had before from you know before the before the event, I'm gonna you know start posing to Paula and we'll have a discussion about. But I would also love to see um, you know, your responses to these questions because some of these things, you know, Paula and I are just two people, and I think some of these questions would be so well posed to everyone and I, I especially this one this one I'm going to ask right now so Paula and I started out by talking about our requirements of social media as you know journalist writer historian and um, a researcher 
So our requirements of social media, but I'd love to sort of think about if, if you could, wouldn't mind posting in the chat, what kinds of requirements do you think arts and culture as a community, as an organization, arts and culture have of social media? What do you feel you need of it? Okay, because we've spent a lot of time talking about how we use social media platforms and how that, you know, how we possibly need to change the way we use platforms based on these developments. And a lot of the lessons that Paula and I have been talking about here have very much been taken from small enclave, you know, like small marginalized communities, from um, grassroots organizations, activist communities, the kinds of lessons that we, you know, the kinds of lessons that we have learned about our usage of social media and the things that we are pointing towards as, you know, the possible needs for, for social media in future are definitely coming from that experience. And I'd love to hear more about, you know, the rest of this. Uh, so, right, that bear that in mind. Please do pop in the chat your thoughts about what requirements arts and culture have of social media. Okay, so another question I've got here is um, that, right, we talked about the politics of using Twitter without compromising our values. Okay, so a, a good question I think I've got here is do organizations, you know, bearing in mind what we've said about not necessarily just pulling the plug altogether and participating in flight, but do organizations need to be thinking seriously about exit strategies? Should we be thinking about specific incidences or trigger points that might cause that total abandonment of Twitter, i.e. a change in moderation policy, a level of engagement loss, loss of adver advertising efficacy? Um, Paula, if you have any thoughts on that, absolutely. But I'm just going to answer that by thinking, um, I think that absolutely, the social media still it still needs to work for you it still needs to be financially viable it still needs to be um you know a useful place to post um in terms of like obviously we do know that lots of advertisers are moving away from twitter at this moment um the changes in moderation policy i just want to make a quick comment on that the moderation policy of most social media platforms is actually very worryingly opaque and always has been this isn't something that is like new to the decline of Twitter. Facebook is also notoriously very close lipped about like their moderation policies. And they also are something that are constantly fluctuating and sometimes they get wrong. So um, what Twitter is actually doing right now is moving away from moderation in light of, you know, wanting more free speech, you know, AKA hate speech. <laughs> so, you know, I think that kind of, what happens when Twitter becomes a place that is just, you know, completely unusable in the sense that it ends up being like a, a very dark side of the internet, like, you know, like dark Reddit kind of energy. Um, I think, yeah, I think we, I think that worrying about that at this point is a little bit premature because, um, and like we said, there are obviously ways of guiding content, um, that means that it reaches the audience that you want. Um, I do think that keeping an eye on that slow slide into, you know, into decay is, is quite an interesting thing to say. I, I do think that's important. Um, Paula, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think you've covered it. I literally would have repeated what you said. Okay. Yeah. Well, we've just got a good question into the chat here. As a theatre company that works with women often excluded by theatre and society, engaging online with marginalised communities has been really important for us. For example, sex workers or women with experience of the criminal justice system. We've noticed that our engagement with communities has dropped over the last few months. Our timeline is not showing the social and cultural activists we usually follow. Do you have any advice on how we re-engage, how to buck the algorithms? So, um, Paula, do you have any thoughts on that um, about the loss of, so is that, well, I mean, first of all, my question would be, is this a case of some of those users moving away from the platform altogether, you know, out of concerns for over increased, um, you know, receiving increased hate speech, et cetera, or whether this is like an unfair algorithm situation where their content is being shadow banned, which Paula is yes. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. It was, um, hi Carly, thank you for the question. Um, I guess it was more 
are you noticing that people are engaging with your theatre company less online or that you're not seeing um, other people or is it like a mix, a combination of both? Um, because I think that that does a combo of both. Okay. Um, this is so frustrating because like the work is so important. I guess I would question whether there are adjacent communities that you can um, connect with because I think the way that the algorithm categorizes a lot of people that pole dance and dancing communities for example are quite um, policed alongside sex worker mm -hmm. communities so I wonder if there's a way of you kind of going horizontally to I guess tangential communities that um that would have hopefully like a lot of um solidarity with the work that you're doing I would yeah I think I would focus on maybe reaching out to more individuals kind of within this sphere um, and see if when you followed them, when you've been following them for a couple of weeks, if you are still having difficulty um, seeing them come through and then maybe you can narrow down whether it's um, more that they are potentially being shadow banned. Oh, sorry, this is, <laughs> these questions with, especially no, yeah, some of my response, are... they're brilliant. Awesome. Some of these are responses to that earlier question about the needs of, mm. of social media as well. So, yeah, I didn't want to cut you off, Paula. Did you have no, anything else you want to say? Um, and I, I guess, Carly, are you utilising, like we said, like the starred out language, um, mm. the hashed out language? Because I know from speaking to um, the people that I spoke to for this article, who I'd be very happy to link you with. There were some really, really brilliant think thinkers who are so clued up, much more clued up on um, bucking the algorithms as people in the pole dance community, as people within sex worker spaces who would be far more equipped to give you advice than me. Um, but, uh, God, what was I saying? <sighs> bucking the algorithm. Yeah, hashed out, um, like, um phrases um there are specific words that it's probably better not to use that I remember being told but I can't remember right now but even if they're not hashtags even if they're somewhere within the caption then mm. that really flags um the, like up against the community guidelines so um yeah but if you, if you um I'll type my uh email in the chat and you can just um email me and I can link you with the people that I spoke to yeah, but don't rush Paula too much. A busy lady, everybody. That's it. <laughs> but the um, the I've got here like some of these convers these um points are just so wonderful. I would like to quickly just ask you all. Um, th there's a there'll be an evaluation link being popped in the chat now as well. Um, we're going to take a one minute break. Very soon. Oh wait, run to. Okay, no, sorry, I'll come back and say that in like two minutes. Don't worry, I've just received some some <laughs> stuff from behind the curtain. So um, working for an arts charity, I need value for money in a time and budget sense, learning materials, forums for feedback and support. And first and foremost, with visual arts, we want less limitation on post format and content. Don't get me started on the labyrinth of Facebook business manager, sub pages and policy. Oh my God, it's so unnecessary, right? Things seem designed to intimidate and in a sector where budget is so tight, often junior staff are running paid promo. It's very tough to know what success should look like. And by the time we learn the ropes, it's changed again. Very true. How can we effectively upskill independent businesses and artists when we struggle to keep up as an authority? I'm also keen to define metrics internally and get away from reporting on follower growth and likes. It's no longer meaningful. Thank you. That's such a really wonderful point, set of points in there, you know, the idea that perhaps the metrics of growth and especially when we're thinking about, you know, what are me what is meaningful engagement? on these platforms that we actually use, you know, thinking about metrics in a different way is really wonderful. Um, my organization is basically all about platforming women, signing a light on women who are not seen and valued in jazz. Um, how, so advocate for a safe and healthy industry yet post on one which isn't, it's a contradiction. How do we balance that? Well, I would just say that, you know, right from um, the beginning, the, uh, the, thinking about you know that that is a return to the ethical question for me you know like the idea is that 
platforms are not necessarily ethical spaces a lot of, I mean a lot of the ways that we engage are not necessarily ethical I, I mean I, I, I work about I work and think about decolonization in universities a lot as well especially in the UK context universities are built on unethical labor they continue unethical labor practices you know we still are in there and you know we are still creating content and um teaching within those spaces and engaging with marginalized audiences in those spaces i would say that that same sort of thinking maps onto platforms quite well you know um they absolutely the platform um is not necessarily an ethical or a safe space but the work that users hack the platform to do is meaningful is ethical you know, when you think about movements like Me Too, like Black Lives Matter, I can't believe these words haven't left my lips yet over the course of this entire call. That seems ridiculous to me. But, you know, like when you think about things like that, those spaces would not have been able, those um, movements, organizations, very important moments would not have been able to happen without um, these platforms. So yes, you can, I I personally believe that you can make ethical good out of, um, out of a space like this. Okay. Um, we are very much running out of time here, so um, I'm going to take this moment to thank Paula so much for joining me, <laughs> my bestie, you know, so <laughs> thank you so much for coming everybody, we've had a really wonderful time talking about this and you know this is such a meaty topic and especially as it is very much continuing. Um, I would love if you could please fill in the short feedback form. Um, you can see that Risha has posted that. Um, it's uh, it's up a few spaces. So, <laughs> but please, oh yeah, there we go. There it comes again. So please do take a minute to fill that out and um, we'll be back in just a moment. We'll give you a minute to fill that. Thank you. I think that's us three, we're out of time. So that's that's your the final comment really. And well, then just... we will not be back in a moment. Please fill that out. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, and echoing that, uh, thanks to both of you for such an interesting and good quality conversation. It's been fascinating to listen to, so much appreciation. And our next webinar is going to be on the, the 28th of February. We'll be thinking about some of the really practical do's and don'ts of running um, uh, running a digital project. So I'm just, I think, just hand back to Fiona if there's a last thing that you wanted to say. Thank you. No, just fascinating and comments have said the same thing, which is, is just, you know, if we can start to frame the questions, we know we don't have all the answers at the moment, but thank you both very much. Really, really, really great, really great conversation. Thank you very much and goodbye, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your days.